After a short time, they noticed a Volvo slowing down, but the occupants made no attempt to retrieve the cases. Ownership of the Volvo was quickly traced to 33-year-old Arthur Hussein, who lived with his 21-year-old brother, Nizam, at Rook's Farm near Bishop Stortford. Police descended on the farm and carried out an extensive search, but they found no trace of Mrs. Mackay. The Hussein brothers denied all knowledge of the kidnapping, but were placed under arrest when Arthur's fingerprints were found on one of the ransom notes. It turned out that they had hatched the plot after seeing Rupert Murdoch being interviewed on television about taking over the news of the world. They assumed he was very wealthy and would pay a large ransom if his wife Anna were kidnapped. However, Alec Mackay had occasional use of Murdoch's Rolls Royce. The Husseins followed Mackay home on the 29th of December, assuming it was Murdoch. With the Husseins in custody still loudly protesting their innocence, the police threw all their resources into a renewed search of Rook's farm and the surrounding area. But they still found nothing. The trial of the Husseins on charges of murder and kidnapping began on the 14th of September 1970. They pleaded not guilty, but were sentenced to life. It was assumed they had disposed of Mrs. Mackay, yet to this day no trace of her has been found. It's very rare for a murder charge to proceed without a body, but the police were convinced the Husseins had killed Mrs. Mackay shortly after discovering they had taken the wrong person. It is believed her remains may lie somewhere on Rook's farm, the tragic outcome of a senseless mistake. Five years later, the person who kidnapped a 17-year-old girl and hid her in a deep underground drain knew precisely who she was. On the night of the 16th of January 1975, the elder brother of a girl who'd been kidnapped attempted to pay off her captor at a pre-arranged meeting. But he got lost and the rendezvous was abandoned. A couple had parked where the handover was to take place. A flashing light puzzled them. It was the kidnapper trying to attract attention. The following morning, police moved into the area and carried out a thorough search for clues. But they failed to find anything which might lead them to the kidnapper and his victim. Leslie Whittle was a 17-year-old student who lived with her widowed mother in the Shropshire village of Hyley. Leslie, who'd been left £82,000 by her late father, was dragged at gunpoint from her bedroom on the night of the 13th of January 1975. The kidnapper left a £50,000 ransom note for Leslie's release. It was the first time in British criminal history that such a young girl had been held for ransom. Police feared for her safety as they continued the search for clues. When the news broke, Leslie's mother and her brother Ronald were besieged by the press. Well, I would just like her to get in touch with me, if at all possible. I think that, um, if I may come in here, that the um, point is that we... The most important thing is that we want Leslie back. We will do whatever is required we want the kidnappers to get in touch with me uh, and I will, after receiving reasonable proof that they are who they say they are, I will do whatever is reasonable to get Leslie back. It was then that Ronald Whittle received instructions to meet the kidnapper for a handover. But they failed to find each other. On the 23rd of January, police got the lead they needed. An officer was carrying out a routine check on vehicles parked near a freight depot. He noticed that a car registration was not the same as the number displayed on the windscreen. The car had been stolen three months earlier. The boot contained a strange assortment of items. These included a tape recording of Leslie's voice, a foam mattress, flashlights, rope and a gun. 
and the gun's bullets match those used in three previous murders. To their horror, the police realized that Leslie had been kidnapped by a ruthless killer, known as the Black Panther. Over a 10-year period, he'd raided 20 post offices in the north of England, killing three employees who got in his way. A substantial reward had been offered for his capture. The police now decided to concentrate on Bathpool Park in Kidsgrove, the scene of the first abortive ransom handover. Hundreds of officers, helped by volunteers, combed the area. Underground was an extensive network of drains and tunnels. On the second day of the exhaustive search, a police officer slowly descended a deep shaft. His torch revealed the naked body of a young girl hanging from a ledge by a length of wire. It was Leslie Whittle. Although the immediate assumption was that she'd been strangled, the post-mortem showed that she'd actually died weeks earlier from sheer terror and shock. Detective Chief Superintendent Bob Booth, who headed the investigation, was appalled. How evil, how ruthless, how terribly wicked this man is that we've hunted for seven weeks. God above, I never dreamt in my wildest dreams he'd do such a thing to a girl. But eight months later, despite 800 officers on the case and more than 60,000 interviews, the police were no closer to finding Leslie's killer. On the 11th of December, 1975, two police officers were questioning a man seen acting suspiciously near a post office. Suddenly, he pulled out a shotgun and ordered them to take him to a nearby village. As they reached the village, one of the policemen grabbed the gun and the car skidded to a halt. Two people rushed over and helped the officers subdue the violently struggling man. He was eventually handcuffed to an iron railing. Police then raided his small terraced house in Bradford. In the attic, they found a bizarre and chilling collection of items, which included guns, knives, hoods, and a coil of wire which matched the wire used to hang Leslie. The police were now certain they had at last caught the Black Panther, the most wanted man in Britain. He was Donald Nielsen, a 39-year-old ex-serviceman who turned to violent robbery because he couldn't live on what he earned as a part-time carpenter. Nielsen's trial for kidnap and murder began at Oxford Crown Court on the 14th of June, 1976. He admitted kidnapping Leslie, but said her death was an accident. Public interest in the case was massive and every day, crowds queue to get a courtroom seat. The evidence against Nielsen was overwhelming. He was found guilty as charged. The tragic death of Leslie Whittle had shocked the whole country. As he passed sentence, the judge said, in your case, life must mean life. If you are ever released from prison, it should only be on account of great age or infirmity. When kidnapping turns to murder, it becomes one of the worst crimes of all. No one ever discovered what happened to little Charlie Ross. There was no doubt that it was murder when the body of Lindbergh's baby son was discovered in the woods. The brothers who snatched Muriel Mackay had tragically mistaken her for someone else. Leslie Whittle fell into the hands of a man who'd already murdered three people. All of these were tragic endings to senseless crimes.